Welcome back, everybody. It is Money Mondays. You know what time of that is? Tool time. Long oh. show. Money Mondays. Welcome, everybody, where we give you the tools on how to buy multifamily real estate <laughs> and succeed, especially in this market. I'll take I'm it. Ferris, I'll take the tool man, and this is... Ben, what's the other guy's uh, name? Tim the Tool I Man, Taylor, it. and uh, the other guy was the guy that actually Taylor's did all probably the work. Like, what are these yeah. guys talking about? The show, <laughs> she's too young for this. Um, what is the other guy? I forget I don't what know. he is. But yeah. We do this every Monday, Monday at three thirty Central. So. Yes, you know. So, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. We want this to be a collaborative, interactive show. So, if you do have comments, questions, concerns, hopefully not a whole lot of concerns, but maybe if you do, drop those in the comments. And if you like the show, please give us a like or a share. You know, we love to, uh, you know, kind of expand the audience a little bit. So, what are we talking about today? Talking about how to use the brrr, B-R-R-R strategy in multifamily real estate. Ooh. For those of you that might have had a residential kind of background, you probably heard of the BRRRR strategy. I think our friend Brandon T- Turner had kind of really pushed probably, this to probably, the limit. I, mean, I don't probably, know if he coined it, but he might, definitely uh, made it popular. You know, and it's right? buy, rehab, rent, refi. Not right. rents, rent. I said, I said rent. Oh, I thought you were saying like rents. <laughs> no, 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 know, no, like, no, no. Rinse and repeat. There's, yeah, a, there's actually another there's R, R in there. there. Another, there there's actually probably two R, R more, two yeah, more so R's there. Buy, rehab, rent it out, and refinance. And then folks. rinse and repeat two more. And then you can. I'm going to coin repeat. the new one. <laughs> yeah. The brr, 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 brr. Um, you can just throw a couple extra but, R's on there. You know, that's kind of what we've done. That's our bread and butter, right? Most of our deals have been that value add component. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we probably really failed at the last R. We like to sell deals instead of the refi, but. You know, I think again, it was also re- indicative of the no, market. No, it's about too. the market. We're market driven, yeah. right? You know, a lot of our deals we've sold, we've refied as well, but more sells than refi. And so, yeah. Um, but we're here to kind of talk about that and dive into what you need to know there. All right. So, we're going to get right back into this. So, check it out. We're going to buy first, right? You know, obviously, that's what we've talked about many times on the show, right? You got to buy right, especially in this market, folks, right? So, How do you go about finding deals that have a value add component, right? You know what I mean? You can start with just the obvious stuff. Does it look like it's a tired property that has a lot of deferred maintenance? You know, when you go and do your property tour, is there, is the staff on point? Are they kind of a little, you know, uh, you know, behind the eight ball? You know, are they not dressed appropriately? Do they even greet you? You know, is it just a poor experience across the board? Because I'm going to tell you one thing, folks. If the staff doesn't try to impress you on a property tour, then that's not the the right staff because that is in in, in essence they're almost pseudo um, you know job you know interview right because you could be the next owner and if they don't even put their best foot forward for you then you know they're not putting the best foot forward for any of those tenants right so you're looking for those types of things and then third to that right the market performance right are the rents under market in comparison to the comps right so you have to do your analysis and do your due diligence and determine these things is this a value add property, right? And if it is, right, you gotta run the gauntlet of getting it under contract and ultimately getting it close. And in this environment, we were at Rod Cleef's mastermind last week, and I think the consensus is, is there's still deals out there. The fundamentals of apartment investing are still there, but damn, interest rates have gone <laughs> through the roof, you know, and they're currently probably hovering in between five and 6% right now, depending on what your lender spread is, right? So you just need to be underwriting deals to that interest rate. And you need to also understand how that's going to affect one of the R's in this strategy, the refinance here in a minute, right? So, you know, kind of getting your way through that buy and purchase process is step number one. Then along that same kind of due diligence process and actually buying the deal, you should be calibrating what your rehab plan and budget's going to be. Right? You need to identify those, those CapEx things that are going to drive the most value. Most of the time, it's going to be interior upgrades and then maybe adding an amenity or two, yeah. right? You know, you're going to also have deferred maintenance that you have to do, yeah. but that's not and ultimately going to jump just, you know, Sometimes it could be as simple as just making tenants think the property's being cared for, right? If you go up yeah. to a property, the grass is not cut, the siding is falling apart. That stuff's actually really cheap to cure. But it will get someone to come in through the door and see that the units are curb nice. Curb appeal. Oh, so my gosh. Curb appeal really goes a long way. So, again, you're trying to spend the time and effort, figure out what what can you do on your property and what can you do with your property re- relative to the market. Yes. Right? So, it's a little bit of both. Because you may have this idea. You may have come from, 
you know, living in uh, what's that? Uh, what's that beach? Uh, the famous beach in which? New York that all the rich people are at. Uh, oh, uh, the Hamptons. The Hamptons. Thank you. You may have grown up oh. in the Hamptons in all your life, and you see an apartment, you're like, you know, we should put gold cl- gold toilets on this thing. I've been well, to the Hamptons. They don't have gold effort. toilets up there, but you know. You went to the wrong part of the Hamptons because <laughs> I have seen those now. Um, but you know, spe- but figure out also what relative to the market. So again, you That's may have true. your gut That's impression, true. but again, it's partially tied to the market and how do you take a step forward, and I think, not take a leap forward. And we've talked about this on the show. I think people try to get creative with their with their capex and what they do as far as a rehab. You don't need to get creative, folks. You fix the things that need to be fixed. You improve your curb appeal. You add or add on to your amenity set, and then you do your interiors. That's it, right? And then look at the comps. What are the comps doing? Don't be that trailblazer. Everybody wants to get creative, and you know, ultimately, you might put that amenity in that. And I'll use an example. You might put a tennis court in there because you like tennis and you think every. Everybody else is like like tennis yeah. too, and then you get in there and guess what? Nobody, you just spend a hundred thousand dollars on a tennis court. And nobody uses the damn thing. It's Maybe because it turned into a big dog park. You never know, right? You know, <laughs> I mean, this, but, my, and I use that. And we have a, a property that has a tennis court and it actually does get used. Point being is is that you have to understand what is your demographic, what are they looking for, and what are your comps doing, right? And you don't want to just over improve the property. You don't want to add stupid money to the property either, right? So really dial in that strategy. And the two people that can help you do that, first and foremost, is your property management company because they should know the demographic and they should know what that market can support in terms of amenities and, and what you should do as far as upgrades. And then get with your general contractor, right? Start getting real world bids on this stuff. And they'll also give you some suggestions on stuff that's going to drive value versus, well, you're kind of just, you know, uh, flushing that money down the toilet. So come up with your strategy. Don't overspend on stupid stuff. You know, map up, map out what those rent pops can be and what your ROI is on the stuff that you're going to do. And then continue to, I guess, drive value really and on I'll the And I'll say property. this too. The plan that you have before you buy the deal may be the pl- not be the plan that you have later in the deal. That's actually a good point. And so good go point. in with an open mind. Don't be the guy that forces the same thing to happen. Because again, a lot of what things are really in life, not even multifamily specific, you know, I'm a big fan of iterative improvements, right? Yeah. Not the, hey, all and done kind of thing. And so you get in there, you try something, did it work, did it not, do you have room to improve? Refine because again, even on the upgrades, you may think, Hey, I can go in and do them. We're actually trying this right now on a property we bought in December. We go in, we do some upgrades. Great, we know we can get those pops, but maybe yep. there's even a higher level of upgrade. We can get better pops, and so you're you or know, you're balancing. Maybe it's a little bit lower, yeah. but right, your return on your investment is higher. So if you went from okay, and let me give you an example, folks, right? Maybe instead of putting 12,000 a door in there to get $200 rent pops. You can put eight thousand dollars a door in there and get one hundred fifty dollars rent pops, right? I'm going to tell you right now, the return on investment is better, right? So you have to look at it from that perspective. But not everything is going to have a direct return on investment, right? Like people expect the roofs to be done and they expect them not to leak on their stuff and cave in when there's a big thunderstorm. So some stuff you're just going to have to do. But our point is, and during this strategy, right, you're trying to buy right and you're trying to rehab correctly, right? Because you're trying to draw, you're trying to buy at the best basis and drive the most value as you possibly can whenever you're doing your rehab. So what is the next R in our brrrr strategy, right? It's rent, right? So again, we talk about the interior upgrades and how much rent pops you can get. You need to be programmatic about how you go in and you upgrade your property and you test the market. Again, your your property management company can help determine, hey, uh, you really should be spending most of your money on the two bedroom, two baths because those are the most in demand for this demographic, right? They're going to know that level of detail, right? And even us, right? We, we go into new markets. We rely heavily on the property management companies to steer us in the right direction until we kind of can start dialing some of that in as we have more and more properties and we get more and more in tune with that market too. But at the beginning, you need to be relying on them and they will help you drive the most value by ultimately rent, uh, rehabbing and renting out the right uh, floor plans. And I think that that's important, right? So again, you start with buying it right. Then you're rehabbing it correctly, right? And you're, you're being methodical about which things are going to drive the most value. Then you're pushing rents. Again, being methodical about it. Renting out and upgrading the floor plans that are going to get you the best yield on those dollars that you're putting into it. Then 
what happens, right? You know, as cap rates continue to either they compress or they expand, doesn't really matter. You're driving the NOI up at the same time, right? So you're making this thing more and more profitable, right? So now you're a year or two into this thing, or maybe you're three years, and you decide, hey, I want to either sell or I want to refinance. Well, part of our strategy now is to try to refinance all Refi, of these deals. Refi, man. I heard a phrase yeah. that I like, and if anyone uses that phrase, they should hopefully give me a... Uh, what, a what, reference. What, no, okay, what, no, this what, phrase what, I did not what, coin what? this one. Uh, basically, well, you, well, you, which ones not, am I stealing from you? I'm not stealing anything. Oh, oh <laughs> this guy. No, no, I do. Actually, I do. There is some phrases that I do like. No, to no, no. Use. Actually, I'll, I'll admit it's a good feeling in life. Whenever you know how they say uh, imitation flattery, right? Well, kind of. Is that what you know? Whenever is? I have a quote and I hear other people use it, it's I appreciate it. So, but um, no, no. Anyways, it's, it's inside joke and being bad. Uh, but what I was trying to get to the phrase that I heard I really liked is. Those that are rich sell. Those that are wealthy hold. I agree. And, you and know, what do we mean by that? Kind of get some context. You know, here. and again, yes, you can make money selling a deal, but if you could afford to hold it, meaning you're okay not taking those immediate wins off, you actually build real wealth, right? Yeah. Deals, if you can hold on to them long enough, you really build wealth mm-hmm. in this business. Real estate is not a get rich quick scheme, right? Doing BRR is about as close as you can get to. Oh. Yeah, I'm just going to ask it all that. It's about <laughs> as close as you can get to. Get rich quick, but it's really about the long term, guys. It is, and, and what do we mean there, folks? Right? Don't don't have those short term ambitions and short term goals of trying to get rich really, really quick. I mean, I think we've also talked about on the show. This is a this is a get get wealthy long term plan. Don't bring short term get rich to quick plan. Long term right? business. You know, I mean, I think it's important. So the refinance component of this, kind of taking this full circle, is that you're going to hold on to it for three years. You're going to go through the refinance process. You're going to pull out some amount of money. Maybe not a lot. Doesn't really matter, right? You want to get that more permanent debt and get it a better interest rate, typically, and then you're going to hold on to it for another call it five to seven years from there. Right, so that is the strategy that's kind of behind all of this, right? But the refinancing is again, it's it's like a closing, right? It's like a positioning of a deal. You have to make sure that financially, you're you're, and you need to work with a mortgage broker. We work with Anton Matley from Peak Financing. You need to work with a mortgage broker to get you the best lender in place that's going to be able to get you the the right loan that you want on a permanent basis, right? Because it is a closing, right? There's a title and there's legal and there's the lender. The whole entire thing is the exact same. The only thing that's different on this strategy versus an acquisition is you're not raising any money, right? But you want to make sure that you don't have to bring any money to the table either. So you want to make sure you get the right loan proceeds that allows you to get out of that loan for no money in, right? Or maybe even pull some money out at the same time, which is always great, and then get into the permanent financing, right? So make sure financially that your deal looks good, right? That you've pushed that re- pushed that revenue, pushed that NOI. You're coming up on a, on a time that makes sense to refinance. Right now, probably not the best time to refinance. Some people are probably in that boat though, right? You know, but there's going to be times when things kind of calm down a little bit, folks. And we, you know, we look at a lot of data and I'm going to say, but go ahead and call it. It's probably in the next two to three years, somewhere in that range where rates will probably start kind of trickling back down. And at that point, it might make sense to refinance, right? So you need to keep your ear to the ground. You need to make sure that financially that the deal makes sense to refinance. You need to work with a mortgage broker to get you the best loan and the best loan proceeds. And then you ultimately need to pull the trigger, right? But realize this is a full-blown closing. They're going to go through the whole process again, right? They're going to be looking at your credit. They're going to be looking at net worth. They're going to be looking at the financials. They're going to ask for all the same documents that an acquisition process has, even if you're using the same lender to do the permanent loan because typically they're two different uh, departments and they're going to go through the whole process. So realize the only thing difference in a refinance is you're not raising any money, right? So that in itself is the BRRRR strategy. So we're going to go ahead and pause, open it up for any Q&A if you got any. Comments, questions, thoughts, please leave it. We will answer them live. Um, Let's see our, our buddy Chris Collins who... I did send you a birthday message. I don't know if you got it, Chris. I tried to mimic what you did to me uh, a few weeks back. But he said, what a great team right here. Disrupt is a real company running in, uh, running a real business. Keep it Thank up, guys. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. We're definitely yeah. trying. As much of a grind as it is. <laughs> it's, uh, no, I mean, we're, here. we're not here to build. I was saying this on the podcast I did today. We're not here to build a short-term two through your company or make a quick buck. We're here to build a legacy company. That's true. If you That's use true. that quote. 
please. I, I probably will steal that <laughs> one, will. actually. But no, I mean, I it's the reality. You're here to build a legacy company. How do you build a company, a culture? I said this in an interview to a uh, uh, person I was interviewing. A, you know, a company and a culture and compensation for people to kind of build that out. And, so. and this is a good point. You need to figure out when you get into this business what you want to do, folks. Like, I think a lot of people get caught up in a boot camp and, you know, a two-day or whatever, and they, they really get excited about going out and, and buying a property. But then they don't really realize that, like, after you buy two or three, you're going to say, okay, what do I want to do with this, right? You can't retire necessarily off of two or three. You know, maybe you can if you get the right deals, but I would I would probably contest that in almost 99% of cases. Then you need to determine, okay, do I want to just specialize in one thing and let some other company do the rest? Or do I really want to build a company here, right? Because at the, at the end of the day, you're going to run out of two things. You're going to run out of money, you're going to run out of time. And if you really want to be, you want to have longevity in this business, most of the smart people are turning this into an actual company that goes out, it's a syndication company that goes out and buys deals and manages them on the back end. So, and this is part of why the Burr strategy is so important for us, is because we are trying to build that legacy company. Boom, see, oh, I already stole, I already stole it from you. you know, but also just because we're looking at it from a long-term perspective, right? So, any other questions? This must seem um, so just so see, straightforward for everybody. Someone is asking, basically, what are we doing in terms of acquisitions in this market? You know, I think we had had some stuff from earlier in the year that we're making our way through. Uh, we talked about it in the last couple of shows. We had Sunbelt Portfolio, which we've since closed out. You know, we have a few other deals that we're making our way through. But, you know, things have changed, right? You know, interest rates have gone up. Um, you know, lenders have kind of... They, they haven't gotten out of the market. There's still liquidity in the market, but they're certainly being just as cautious as we are, right? You know, the one thing, and, and we talked about this last week at an event that we were at, is the fundamentals are still there, right? So you still have rent growth, and the pro, and the places that we're investing in, at least, you know, which is the Sun Belt in Texas, you still have population and job growth. You have low tax situations, right? You know, you have landlord-friendly states. All of those are great for multifamily. And the one thing that I would probably say, take it for what it's worth, right, is that people that would traditionally try to get into their first home are now getting priced out of the market because interest rates, you know, from six months ago were at three and now they're at five and a half, six in some cases. You know, that's just gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna whack a couple people out of the market. And what are those people gonna do, folks? They're typically gonna continue to rent and they're gonna typically continue to rent in an apartment. So you're gonna to continue to have that demand driver for apartments. So all of those things really haven't changed. The only dynamic that has changed is that the interest rate has spiked. And I think, you know, you give that some time that it's gonna kind of get to a dull roar too. You know, what, what the Fed is trying to do now is kind of kill demand by, you know, essentially jacking up interest rates. But they're gonna to get to an inflection point where it's gonna start killing the economy at the same time. And at that point, right, you have this tipping over, they're gonna start lowering interest rates. So you're saying if I wanna run for Fed chairman, I should wait until after they've killed the economy. Yes, yes, I don't become yes. that guy that killed the Jerome economy. Powell will be another pariah just like the rest of them. They, they, nobody can time the market, folks, including the Fed. So you just have to play along with what their decisions are and just be prepared. But there's always deals in every part of the cycle, and that's what I'm always telling people. All right, so I like this question from our buddy Chris as well. Is there a size property that is more prone to a BRR strategy? And I think uh, I think there is. Oh, and what yeah. I mean is like, you know, we've done it on small and big, but I think it's all about your buyer pool, right? And how quickly you can, because I think the thing that's kind of ignored, actually, sorry, let me rewind. No, I changed it back. I was thinking of the exit, what we've done. I for would say, beer, burr, I, actually, yeah. You could do it on any size property. I, I would say, would is. it be the easier one to do? Maybe it's a little bit I smaller. Think maybe, is it? But maybe even bigger because you get stability and a little bit more reliability. So it's easier to know if I get these upgrades in year three, I'll actually will hit these numbers, right? Where the smaller deal, you have you still have so much more susceptible. I don't know. That's a good question, man. I mean, maybe I think it's question. all in the eye of the beholder. And, and I think, you know, I mean, it also, you have to look at, the one, the one thing that I'd say is probably a, you know, a decision-making factor is on the smaller deals, you're going to have less loan options than on a bigger deal, yeah. right? So, you know, like, let's just say something sub 100 units, you know, you're probably, or, or maybe sub 10 million, right? You're only going to have a few lenders that are going to take yeah. that on. And so, right? so I agree with you. So I think the answer to Chris's question, as much as you're going to hate it, the answer is any deal that is five to 70 million. That's the sweet spot of loan sizes. 
I'd probably say, I'd probably it. say closer to ten to seventy. But, yeah. but if you're above five, you can get a small balance, right? I mean, no, it, no, but my point, yeah, you can get a small balance, but they're making those more difficult. No, for no, people actually, to get sorry, there. you're right, you're right. You know, no, no, I, I agree. Mean, lenders, is, lenders you know. have been complaining about the five to eight, so we've, we've kind of what we've been hearing. So yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, Maybe you look tw- at Hilltop, twenty to seventy. You know, is a sweet we, spot. we out of the six deals that we've recently bought, right? Hilltop that was, was the hardest, smallest, yeah. and that's the hardest one that we had to get debt on. The bigger ones, you have these big firms chasing after that. Yeah, right. So you know, I mean, I think there's really not a clear cut answer to that, man. But that's a great question. You know, I probably we say it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle range. We don't like super, super huge properties either because on the back end, when we go to sell in seven to eight, nine years, right, having a buyer's pool is also going to be limiting too, right? Because there's not going to be a lot of people that can buy a six, seven, eight hundred unit property. Yeah. Right? It's just too big. All right. right. Let's see. Next question. Will you be at MFIN Con? So two things. Yes, I'll be there Either this way. weekend, but then also more importantly, our conference MFIN is coming up in uh, July, July 23rd. So if you're going to be there this weekend, look forward to seeing you. Please reach out. I'll be there mm-hmm. Friday all day and Saturday, first half of the day. Um, but MFIN is Saturday uh, is July 23rd in Seattle. So would love to see you guys there as well. Yeah, check it out. www.mfi or excuse me, mfinvestornetwork.com. July 23rd, Seattle. We got Mr. Brandon Turner with the beard. We got Mr. Neil Bawa coming back to see us. Mr. Robert Helms, Tom Wheelwright. Tons of panels. Tons of ne- networking opportunities, folks. And it's in Seattle in July. Beautiful time of the year to be up there. So maybe come a day or two early. Stay with the family. Maybe stay a little bit longer, one or two days afterwards. Yeah. For anyone that comes, if you want, Ben will go on a 10-hour hike with you. So please come sign up. We'll make sure to get Ben out there. No, no, uh, no. About but that. no, we'd love to see you guys but there. It's a beautiful time of the year. I will give you a coupon code. So check it out. <laughs> Disrupt to get your $100 off. That is my offer to you. You don't want to do a 20-mile hike with, with, with our uh, no, lovely audience? I don't know. I mean, you know, it might, might be a little bit difficult, man. i gotta get, I got to get in shape well, for I'm going to make sure Chris Collins takes yeah, you up on no. it. Uh, but, all right, well, if you're in Houston, July 7th, check us out as well. DisruptEquity.com slash HTX Meetup. This is our monthly meetup that we've been hosting since 2015. We love to have people come out when they're in Houston. We typically get 100, 150 people out there. This month, we're going to talk about multifamily passive investing. We're going to have a panel of some great passive investors that are kind of give their perspective on what they're seeing and how different operators do different things. And we'll, we'll kind of run them through the gamut, right? We always talk about it from an active syndicator perspective, but it's always nice to talk to the investors too, right? The passive investors. So please check that out July 7th, 7 p.m. at the Pitch 25 Beer Park if you are in Houston. Absolutely. Chris right? Collins says, 10-hour hike, you're pot committed now. Game over. <laughs> so. Ouch, 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 ouch. All right, so what are we talking about next week? Different market cycles for for buying multifamily real oh estate. So we are gosh. definitely in a very different cycle, part of the cycle that we were 60, 60 days, days ago. ago. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's so. a lot. So we'll continue to talk about this on this show, folks. So stay tuned. We are looking at more deals still to this day than anybody in the country. So we have some pretty unique perspectives on this. So stay tuned next week. Different market cycles for buying multifamily real estate. Thank you.